Hello, uh, my name is Dan Daly from Intel, and uh, we're here today to talk to you about uh, P4OBS. Uh, this is a project uh, that we've been working on uh, uh, across uh, ONF, Orange, and Intel uh, to take uh, some of the parts uh, uh, that's in the open source today uh, for P4 and combine them with uh, both OVS and the kernel that underpins o OVS uh, to, to create a, a, a programmable platform on the host. Uh, and the way that this uh, uh, fits together uh, sort of looks like this. And so in this tutorial, we've broken it down into six different parts. Uh, and in the first three parts, we're gonna talk about the architecture and how uh, we are, we're developing the software for P4OBS. And then the second uh, set of three, we're going to talk about a few examples. And each of the examples is uh, uh, showing a different path to program uh, P4OBS and also program the pipeline underneath. Uh, and some of the things that uh, uh, are different in P4OBS versus regular OBS is that we've, uh, we've added uh, this P4 uh, runtime path to be able to program uh, uh, the, the data plane underneath. And we've also, uh, as you'll see in the slides, created this additional data plane path where uh, all three of these control planes are going to be able to control uh, a set of P4 programs that are implementing the uh, kernel data plane, the OBS data plane, uh, and uh, any of the programmable logic that's coming from an SDN controller or a local agent that wants to add additional innovation on top of what's, uh, what's already in the kernel and, and what can be done with OBS. So with that, we'll go into the first section uh, of, of um, going to be presented by Namrata. Um, hi, this is Namrata from Intel, um, and um, I work on P4 OBS along with uh, collaboration with Orange and ONF. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with a slide that I presented back in December in OBS conference. Uh, right side is a picture that depicts uh, OBS layers, um, and uh, we have OF Proto that uh, supports the OpenFlow protocol uh, interface, and uh, we have OF Proto DPIPs, which is the interface to data path. Um, so here in P4OBS, what we are doing is we are developing uh, um, a P4 Proto, a parallel, parallel of OF Proto that supports, um, uh, that supports P4 uh, protocol and um, has an interface to the P4 controllers uh, using P4 runtime and uh, open config servers. So P4 Proto um, uh, interfaces with the data planes and provides uh, support of uh, three kinds of control planes. The first one being um, OBS itself. Uh, so OBS has a way to configure um, uh, configurations into um, uh, uh, configurations into OBS like VXLAN um, and um, uh, mirroring and stuff. And um, 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 and we um, and and we are implementing support for mapping of these uh, configurations into P4 Proto. So uh, uh, this will end up configuring config, configuring some P4 tables into the P4 Proto, and uh, P4 Proto has an uh, as an interface to the target. So these P4 tables are propagated onto the target um, backends. Uh, the second uh, control plane is uh, P4 runtime plus open config. So this is uh, this works via the gRPC and the GNMI interfaces. And uh, this is the P4 controller interface, which uh, we're going to use for explicitly programming the P4 tables um, uh, into the targets. Um, uh, an example would be container load balancing. Um, the third uh, control plane is the kernel control plane. Um, so the uh, Linux kernel control plane. Uh, so any changes in the configurations in the uh, kernel can be mapped to uh, the P4 tables um, uh, for the fixed functions. Um, this could be done via SI. Um, and this orange line here is basically um, uh, displaying uh, the messages from the kernel to the P4 proto. An example would be FRR or ECMP. So these examples, uh, we are going to um, uh, talk on these examples in part uh, four, four, five, and uh, six. Um, in the later part of the tutorial in detail. Um, uh, so all of these control three control planes can be used to program um, the same people file or different people files on the people targets. And uh, there is um, and people run, and there's a support for multiple people runtime clients that connect um, and program different people pipelines. For the data planes, uh, we have um, PSA EBPF that is gonna be covered in um, 
to do in, in the part three uh, by Orange. Um, and we have P4DBTK. Um, so uh, if you want to know more about P4, P4DBTK, we have another talk uh, that is done by Intel folks, um, Christian and Han. And uh, if you want to know more about it, please uh, go ahead and attend that talk. Um, we also have we also have support for um, hardware targets, which is before switches, before NICs, um, like Tofino and uh, some Intel before uh, before NICs. Um, so uh, double clicking onto P4 Proto. Uh, so this these are the uh, building blocks of P4 Proto. The table API is basically a common programming interface uh, for all of these control planes. Um, so these control planes end up calling the uh, the table API functions for uh, flow add, flow delete, uh, port add, port delete, um, counters and meters, um, et cetera. And um, that in turn programs the P4 targets here. Um, so P4 runtime and op open config servers uh, talk to the P4 run runtime control planes or the STN controller using uh, gRPC for P4 runtime and GNMI for open config. Um, then we have the OB OF mapper here that the second control plane, um, which is the OBS. So any configurations coming from OBS are going to be mapped to the P4 runtime and which calls the table API. And the third control plane Linux is supported by this Netlink in interface, which listens to the configuration changes in the kernel and um, uh, translates to SI API, uh, which in turn calls uh, the table API itself. Um, uh, so P4 targets could be um, P4 DPDK, P4 um, EBPF. Um, as I said before, this is uh, this is just an example target that I have uh, blocked here, which is which is programmed um, uh, SAI and Antria two pipelines, P4 pipelines, and we'll expand more into that as, as we go ahead in the uh, in the presentation. Um, so we also have a tap interface here that uh, is used to uh, transfer the packets from the P4 targets to the OBS. This is one way of um, sending the packets to OBS. So OBS in this case will support um, uh, support um, the control flow and um, uh, use the L2 bridging functionality or hard responders, um, things like that to respond to these uh, incoming packets from the P4 target. So uh, these tap interfaces are basically used for that. Um, going on to the next uh, slide. So how do we build P4 OBS? So um, we have for the coupled targets, so now we have P4 targets and for the coupled P4 targets, we, um, we, um, uh, we link the table API directly with, uh, with the target. So if there is a um, target like uh, DPTK, then we, uh, it, uh, it will link with the live uh, P4DPTK.SO and create the table API here, which can be used uh, in P4 OBS. Um, uh, if it is a decoupled target, then this will be a live backend.so uh, for uh, P4 eBPF or, um, uh, or for um, any hardware targets that we have, um, which are used. Uh, so this library is basically, the live backend is basically used to program the targets, um, uh, program the P4 pipeline or, um, or um, uh, anything that comes from the table API into the target. Um, then uh, the, B, the live BF node uh, is basically an abstraction layer uh, that we integrate with OBS uh, over this table API. Uh, so this ends up calling the table API. It is kind of a manager, uh, abstraction manager layer. And uh, this one, uh, the live BF node is actually linked with the table API and, um, uh, and is called, in, uh, called by the P4 OBS functions. Uh, so finally, there is the P4 OBS binary that um, will link in the uh, live BF node statically. So I talked about multiple control planes um, and multiple P4 files uh, before. This is um, an, an example of that. Uh, so in the blue, we have um, the physical networking pipeline. Um, an example would be SIR or P4. Um, so this, uh, this pipeline can support uh, physical functions like um, VXLAN, uh, NCAP and DCAP and hash routing, ACLs, um, lag, um, all of those functions. And uh, the, the controller that controls this pipeline um, uh, is from the kernel. So kernel control plane is basically controlling the uh, additions and deletions into the tables uh, of, for this pipeline. And then uh, the top pipeline layer on top of the physical is the virtual networking pipeline. An example would be Antria which handles a uh, spoof guard or uh, connection tracking or load balancer or queue proxy functions um, and uh, forwards it um, to the VMs uh, or pods. 
Uh, this could be controlled by uh, the SDN controller or the CNI proxy controllers. Um, so uh, we support per port, port pipeline, uh, which means we have a pipeline dedicated for every port. Um, so uh, if, if the packet is coming from the physical port or a TEP, it would first enter the um, physical networking pipeline, the SI, SIRA P4, and, um, uh, and hit the SIRA P4 tables first. Uh, from here, uh, the packet is decapped here and is sent up into this VXLAN uh, zero port uh, into the Antria pipeline. For software data planes, this VXLAN uh, zero could be uh, either a packet buffer or an internal port. Uh, for hardware, this capability will have to be supported from going over from one uh, before file to the other. Um, so uh, when the packet reaches um, the Antria pipeline, it goes through the tables of Antria pipeline and gets forwarded to the VMs or pods, or would come back to uh, the side or P4. Uh, if a packet is coming from a V port or a Q proxy or a local gateway, then it hits the Antria pipeline first here um, and goes into the uh, Antria classifier block first. Uh, for the virtual networking. Uh, after it goes from here, it will come down to Psi, um, and um, if it has to go out of the tunnel port, it will get encapped here and, um, and head out. So this is an example of um, having multiple P4s and how we are, we are going to program. We're going to talk more on this uh, in the later uh, slides, and um, I will now hand over to Brian for uh, more details on the P4 runtime control plane. Thank you. Thanks, Namrata. Uh, so today, uh, my plan is to talk to you about some of the new interfaces that we're bringing to P4OVS and how we implement them. So the first part, uh, we'll focus on identifying some of these new interfaces, uh, specifically uh, P4 Runtime and GNMI. Uh, these form both an interface to existing parts of P4OVS, like the OF Proto stack, uh, as well as uh, control plane components that can be run on the same host or in a uh, SDN style on a, on a different host. Uh, and I'd also like to explain how we map these new interfaces to the table API, uh, which is uh, the interface that we have to the various uh, targets that uh, were described before. So first, let's just take a quick look at um, how these interfaces and, and various things interact with the switching pipeline. So we start with uh, a switching pipeline uh, we abstract that pipeline uh, using uh, something called an architecture. Uh, PSA, or the portable switch architecture, is, is one popular example from the uh, P4 uh, consortium, but there are other examples here as well. Uh, and there's also uh, a new portable NIC architecture, which is, is similar, uh, but slightly different. So once we have an architecture, uh, that architecture describes the various building blocks that we have to control and configure. So let's start with the interfaces. And before we get into the interfaces, it's helpful to understand the abstraction or the actual phys physical target that we have to program. And the easiest way to do this uh, is to start with the building blocks uh, that we have as part of the switching pipeline or the, the target ASIC. Uh, in this case, there's typically uh, things like um, packets come in ports, they go through a parsing phase, they go through match, a match action phase, um, and then they're ultimately uh, going to be replicated, uh, buffered, queued, dropped um, before going through egress processing, where we have an opportunity to manipulate the packet one more time uh, before it goes uh, out over the, the wire. So uh, in this case, um, rather than have to deal with each ASIC target independently, uh, we have an abstraction of this pipeline called an architecture. Uh, PSA is one example uh, of such an architecture that stands for the portable switch architecture from the, the P4 consortium. There's also a portable NIC architecture, which is uh, similar but slightly different. And then many vendors provide uh, target specific architectures um, that also expose uh, these various uh, building blocks and elements. So once we have an architecture, we're ready to write a P4 program. So this P4 program uh, is defined uh, to specify the specific behavior of a parser. It defines the header fields the, um, and the packet uh, formats that are going to be acceptable for this particular pipeline. This program is compiled into um, various uh, target-specific backend uh, binaries that get, get pushed to the target, but the interface uh, that they expose is going to be similar across uh, the variety of targets that we have. 
Ultimately, the, the goal of this phase is to configure the pipeline, get the pipeline ready to receive packets and ready to receive table entries uh, that are gonna make forwarding decisions based on, on packet headers. And as you can see, uh, typically, uh, and with PSA, it's the parser and the pipeline phases uh, that are programmable using P4. Once we have our pipeline loaded on the device and our, our profile, uh, the device has, has a personality, it now knows how it's gonna receive and forward packets. Uh, the next phase is, is controlling that pipeline at runtime. And this is where P4 runtime comes in. So P4 runtime gives us an ability um, to, to manipulate various uh, parts of the pipeline that have been described in P4. For example, um, table entries uh, are, are sort of a, a a critical part of, of your runtime control. And all the tables, registers, counters, uh, they're all manipulated using the P4 runtime interface directly on the pipeline stages that, that, they describe, that are described in P4. Uh, in the parser, sometimes we can manipulate uh, values that are used uh, as part of parsing decisions. And that also is something we can control during P4. And P4 does provide a little bit of traffic management, uh, specifically around a replication and multicast. So we can do, um, we can do, we can create entries uh, which go into the, the packet uh, replication engine um, as part of P4 runtime. Now you'll note that there are also a number of components here that are not configurable via P4 runtime. P4 runtime is focused on forwarding behavior, forwarding control, but configuration is. Uh, the job of an interface called GNMI. So using uh, GNMI we, and, and open config models, uh, Yang models that define uh, specific configuration uh, behavior, uh, we're able to configure the rest of these building blocks in the pipeline. For example, in the port side, we can configure um, port speeds, uh, whether they're enabled or not, breakout mode, et cetera. Um, on the replication side, we can, uh, we can provision queues um, and we can manage uh, the traffic scheduler um, as part of, part of buffering and queuing as well. And then we can also control the egress port. So taken together, um, P4 architectures define the building blocks that we have in the pipeline. P4 programs specifically configure these building blocks and get them ready for forwarding. P4 runtime is used to insert and remove entries from these building blocks uh, throughout the network operation. And then GNMI and OpenConfig are used to configure the, the fixed portions of the pipeline, as well as some of the peripherals that attach packets to this. If this was um, a little bit confusing or you wanna get more details, uh, we have a, a pretty robust tutorial um, from the ONF, the, the link is here. Um, it, it's a pretty comprehensive tutorial. It'll probably take a day or two to work through. Uh, there are also some exercises and, and real world examples to give you experience. So if, if you're not up to speed yet on, on P4 runtime GNMI or how this all fits together, I'd highly encourage you to take a look at that. But um, for now, what we'll do is, is assume that, that these interfaces are what, what are available and these are what we're building in P4 OBS. One specific area of P4 runtime that I just want to highlight um, because it's particularly relevant to P4 OBS is P4 runtime's multi-client uh, architecture. So unlike uh, other control plane interfaces, uh, perhaps like OpenFlow, P4 runtime was designed to have multiple controllers um, interacting with various parts of the pipeline at the same time. And so with P4 runtime, there's uh, a role configuration. Uh, this describes the various pipeline elements and, and what and categorizes them into roles that, that can be used. Uh, and then we have a, a, a process called mastership arbitration where various control plane clients or components can uh, negotiate for and, and gain um, right access to these various roles. So maybe for a more concrete example, if your P4 program contains two logical phases, maybe you have an underlay phase which would be controlled um, like your physical fabric. Maybe this is something like Psi.P4. Um, you can have these underlay tables uh, described as one role. And then maybe if you have an overlay uh, where you do virtual networking, maybe like your CNI, Kubernetes uh, CNI plugin, maybe uh, Antria uh, plugin, 
uh, those tables can be described and, and categorized into another role. So we have a single logical P4 target with two, um, two different categories of, of capabilities. And in this case, the P4 runtime server will allow the underlay client, maybe uh, FRR, um, Sonic, the, the link, uh, link aggregation protocols to control the underlay. And it'll allow the um, Kubernetes container uh, networking subsystem to control the overlay. Um, and these can, these can operate in, in parallel and, and they won't step on each other because P4 runtime will enforce that um, the various components can only control the parts of the pipeline that they are um, primary for. Um, furthermore, if you, if you want to build out a, um, a highly available architecture, that typically means having more than one client um, that's ready and able to step up and, and program tables uh, in the event of a failure or a partition. And in this case, you can have any number of backup uh, clients connected for a given role. And then if a primary is, it, it does go down uh, or becomes disconnected, then uh, the backup uh, can assert that it wants to become the primary and take over the responsibilities. So this is something that is critical, I think, for, for P4OVS and many other targets. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, we do have, have the capability in, in this uh, particular um, architecture to support this um, multi-primary with backup uh, solution quite, quite uh, cleanly. So moving on to the implementation side, um, we, we, we first have to zoom in a little bit on, on the architecture diagram. And what we're specifically talking about is how do we implement the P4 runtime or sorry, the P4 proto block in the P4 OVS architecture, as well as what is this data plane interface uh, to the various targets that we have provided. And so what we have on the, on the top side here is we have P4 runtime and GNMI. Um, P4 runtime is responsible for pushing the pipeline, writing tables, externs, uh, action profile members, et cetera. Um, and the GNMI is more on the port configuration, buffer management, scheduler config, et cetera. And so in, in this case, uh, we have, or we're able to use standard server implementations. Um, these were originally built and borrowed from, from Stratum, uh, but we're working with the P4 consortium to, to make these available as, as standalone components. Um, and these, um, these allow for consistent behavior across P4 OVS, Stratum, and, and any other switch target uh, that you, you may want to use in the future. Um, the second thing that we do is once we have these entities uh, in, in, our, in our domain, we need to map these entries to the table API. And this is still a little bit abstract, but we've created uh, this, these manager layers, uh, which understand both the table API as well as the P4 uh, entities. And they are able to do conversions between them and then make calls directly against uh, the table API. So the takeaway here really is, you know, we're working to develop common server and mapping layers um, that can be reused. Uh, we want to reuse these across different switching stacks as well as on different P4 targets. And being able to reuse, especially the mapping layer, is, uh, is, is, is really, really interesting because it allows us to take the same stack and put it on top of CPU, NIC, um, and, and ASIC uh, as well. So let's jump into the table API. Um, so table API is uh, a pretty straightforward interface. Um, it's got your standard create, read, update, delete operations, and everything structured as a table object. So what's critical to, be, to, to, inter to interact with this interface is that you know the table ID, uh, you provide a key, and then you provide any additional data um, as part of this object, which goes into the, the, the database. So some of these uh, tables get generated from the P4 program dynamically. So for example, on the left here, we have this uh, JSON representation of the table schema from our P4 program. So for example, we have a, uh, a routing table called routing v4. It gets an ID. Uh, there's a key on this routing table, the IPv4 dest address. Uh, and you can see it's a 32-bit uh, LPM uh, match type. 
And then there's an action, uh, which is the, the data portion of our object. In this case, the next hop ID, uh, which is a 32-bit 32 um, 32-bit field. Um, there's also other actions or opportunities uh, which can be provided here, like drop, um, et cetera. So you know you can have different action choices uh, that are going to be mapped into the data portion. The other part of the table API is the fixed portion. And the fixed portion is going to be the same regardless of your P4 program. This is going to be where some of the port configuration, QoS, replication, um, all of this stuff uh, fits in. And as you can see, each target is going to have a, a variety of table schemas. Uh, this is exa an example from the port schema um, for the various parts that you can control. So we have a port table uh, you can see on the right. Um, the key there is the, the, the port ID or the device port. And then we have various attributes and data that we can set, like the speed, uh, FEC for or error correction, whether the port's enabled or disabled, um, things like that. So if, if this is uh, looking familiar to you, um, this table API um, in, in the context of, of Tofino has been called BFRT um, in the past. And this is, um, this is an interface that we're looking to not just have on Tofino, but also uh, Nix, the DBDK, and the eBPF targets. Um, one last slide uh, in terms of you know, mapping, just to make this a little bit more concrete, is that if we start with a P4 entity on the left, we're going to have the P4 table ID, the P4 uh, matches and, and actions that are provided, as well as things like maybe a priority. And what the, the job of the, the mapping layer uh, that we've described so far is to basically convert these P4 entities or maybe the GNMI uh, or open config entities to this table API. And so what we can do is we can instantiate uh, a table key, table data. We can map the table ID uh, from, from the P4 entity. We can map the match field into the key. We can match the or map the action portions into the, the table data. Uh, and then we can also map other attributes into data like the priority. Um, most of the time, we can convert these things directly, particularly for, for P4 entities to the, the table API um, things. But sometimes, like for example, in priority, we need to do a little bit of conversion. And in this case, uh, P4 runtime uses a different priority mechanism. Uh, it's an inverted priority mechanism. Uh, so, so we have to sometimes make some, some manipulations here. So quickly in summary, um, what we're doing as part of P4OVS is introducing two new interfaces, uh, P4 runtime and GNMI to P4OVS. And we're, we're leveraging and building uh, common layers, specifically the, the server layer and the mapping layer uh, for, for uh, P4OVS that can be leveraged on multiple switching uh, OSs and on multiple switching targets. So um, hopefully that, that uh, provides a little bit of clarity into, into what we're doing here. And next up, we're going to have uh, Tomas and uh, Mateus from uh, ONF and Orange talk about how specifically we map uh, from table API down to the eBPF target and, um, and ultimately how the eBPF the eBPF target can be implemented for P4OVS. Uh, so hello, uh, I'm Mateusz from Orange and we want to present you a new P4 target, PSA eBPF. This is a kernel space target based on eBPF technology, uh, which is also planned to be an option for the P4OVS data path. We work on new P4 compiler that is compliant with the PSA architecture and maps before objects to the eBPF subsystem. Before speaking how we do that, let's introduce quickly to the eBPF. eBPF is a technology that provides an internal virtual machine for packet filtering. This virtual machine runs an eBPF bytecode compiled out from C-restricted programs. While uh, BPF programs are being loaded, um, BPF verifier verifies if the program is safe to run in kernel space. After successful checks, these programs can be attached at different hooks. From networking perspective, the most important are XDP and TC hook. 
XDP hook is one of the first moment of packet processing in, in kernel. Thus, it gives us better performance than TC hook. On the other hand, TC hook has more BPF helpers, external functions to handle complex tasks. Last but not least component uh, are BPF maps, key value stores for stateful packet processing. Our goal is to design how the PSA architecture can be mapped to the eBPF subsystem and build a P4 compiler that will translate a PSA program to the eBPF representation. In our design, we follow two-step compilation process. Firstly, we generate the C program from a P4 program uh, thanks to our PSA eBPF compiler and then the C code is compiled down to the eBPF bytecode by the Kalang compiler. Now I, I leave the floor to Tomasz. Thank you Mateusz. Um, so as Mateusz said the main challenge was uh, how to map the PSA architecture to the eBPF subsystem and basically we decompose the PSA architecture into three eBPF programs and we make use of three different hook uh, hooks, XDP, TC ingress, and TC egress. Due to some limitations of the XDP hook, we come up with a generic TC-based architecture that allows us to implement any PSA program. Uh, the most important uh, limitation of the XDP is, is it does not support packet cloning, and therefore we cannot implement a full, uh, full PS, PSA specification there. However, we may adjust the architecture depending on the PFA program structure. Uh, the diagram presents the overall architecture of the solution. Uh, the red blocks represents the PSA architecture, while the green blocks and nodes defines the BPF mechanisms used to implement the PSA specification. As I said, we use three, um, three hooks in the eBPF subsystem. And the first point where the packet is being processed is the XDP, uh, XDP hook. And in fact, we don't perform any P4 uh, related packet processing here. Uh, the role of, the, um, of this program uh, attached to XDP is to prepare a packet to be processed uh, by the TC layer. In particular, it does a trick to make the um, TC subsystem protocol independent. Uh, then a packet arrives to the TC ingress where the PSA ingress block is performed. Uh, the BPF program here is generated from the P4 um, from the P4 program and implements the predefined behavior. Uh, the part of this uh, eBPF program is a fixed function block uh, called PSA Traffic Manager, which which is mainly responsible for packet cloning by um, by calling the BPF clone redirect helper. Uh, here, a packet may be also resubmitted, cloned, or sent to the egress port. Uh, if a packet is cloned or sent to the egress port. It is handled further by the TC egress, uh, which does the egress processing according to the logic defined in the P4 program. Uh, after the egress block, a packet may be sent out to the output port, cloned back to the egress, or recirculated. Uh, for the packet recirculation, we assume that there is a special recirculation, recirculation interface created, and the packet is being sent to the uh, ingress part of the recirculation port. Next, we will show how the architecture uh, is implemented in detail. Uh, so on the diagram, we see the P4, uh, P4 pipeline, which is composed of parser, control block, and the deparser. And the single P4 pipeline is translated to a single eBPF program. Please note that for the implementation, we significantly base on the, op on the open source P4C eBPF and P4C XDP compilers uh, that come with a lot of features already implemented. And our contribution is mainly related to the performance optimizations and the implementation of the, PF, uh, of the P4 externals defined in the PSA specification. So taking a look uh, at this diagram, um, uh, if a packet arrives to a pipeline, it is firstly handled by the, by the parser, uh, or the par uh, by the parser. Uh, the parser used, uh, uses a special uh, on-stack variable, which is called parse headers. 
and this structure is being filled with the data from the packet and is further used by the control block uh, to perform operations on, on, on a packet and by the deparser to construct an outgoing packet. In the control block, a P4 developer might define a set of P4 objects like P4 tables, uh, counters, or other externs to implement the target, uh, target logic. And in case of our P PSA eBPF compiler, we heavily use, a, heavily use a combination of BPF maps to implement all the P4 objects like tables, uh, externs, or value sets, for, for example. Uh, the control plane application can communicate with the data path uh, by performing operations on the BPF maps, which are shared between a kernel uh, and user space. Finally, the deparser is responsible for constructing, uh, constructing an outgoing packet and sending, uh, sending it to the, uh, to the egress port. Mm. Here we have a uh, deep dive into how the um, parser is implemented. So uh, the, as Mateusz said before, the P4 program is uh, translated to the, uh, to the C representation. And on the left side, we present the um, sample P4 parser, which is uh, converted to the C program uh, presented on the right. Uh, first of all, there is a shared header structure which stores information about all packet headers supported by a P4 program. And then we, uh, in the parser, uh, we use a set of go-to statements to implement a parser, sta parser state machine. Uh, in each state, the header structure is filled by using a set of load functions that takes the data from a packet buffer and copies it to the shared uh, header structure. And then if a packet is, uh, has been successful, successfully processed, the validity bit uh, is set. And next we use a switch statement to make the uh, to make the hop to to a next state. Uh, if a packet is accepted, the program jumps directly to the control block. And in the control block, uh, we probably have a set of match match action tables. And our compiler generates two uh, BPF maps uh, for each P4 table. The first BPF map uh, stores actual table entries, uh, entries. However, the second map is dedicated to store the default action and has only one entry. To achieve the fastest possible lookup, we use array map for the default action map. Uh, next, in the control block, uh, if a table is applied, uh, the key structure is composed from a headers uh, structure field. And the lookup to the main BPF map is performed. If there is no if there is no value under the given key, the eBPF program performs a second lookup, uh, this time to the default action map, and in in this case the value uh, will always exist in the map. So uh, if the table enter is finally found, the program checks uh, what is the action to be performed, and executes the the the, the action. Regarding P4 externs, uh, we can say that uh, all of PSA externs are possible to implement in eBPF subsystem. Most of them are already implemented. Uh, to give an overview of how we design and implement P4 externs, uh, we present uh, the example of P4 digest. For each digest instance, there is a separate uh, BPF map generated. The map type for digest is BPF map type Q, which is a, which is a simple uh, FIFO Q uh, that makes sending data from kernel space to user space possible. If the pack method is invoked, uh, then the new element is pushed into the Q, and after that, the a uh, user space application can read digest messages. Let's go now to the last part, the parser. The parser uh, written in MP4 looks very simple. Uh, in this example, only emits uh, two headers. Uh, on the right side, uh, there are more operations. At the beginning, we do the packet cloning uh, thanks to metadata. 
uh, after that, depending of, on if there was an encapsulation or decapsulation, uh, we, uh, the packet size is shrinked or extended. Next, uh, all of the fields are being emitted, are written by, by byte uh, to the packet. At the end, uh, the packet is sent thanks to PPF helper function, BPF redirect. To sum up, the PSA eBPF target is planned to be an option for the P4 of ES data path, and we are going to publish it by the end of 2021. Currently, we are focused on the performance optimizations. But this is all from our side. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to walk you over an example um, of how the packet flows, uh, how the ARP and ECMP packet flows uh, through the VXLAN setup in V4 OBS. Um, so I have an example set up here uh, with host one and host two configured. Uh, so host two here is configured with a stock OBS, um, uh, so regular OBS with um, two bridges. One is an internal bridge uh, where, uh, on which VM2 is um, uh, is, pro, uh, is um, con configured, and uh, the tunnel bridge, we are TEP, um, uh, which basically is an endpoint, a uh, tunnel endpoint for uh, the host one. Uh, this is connected to a physical port here, port one. Um, uh, the physical port on the right is connected to the physical port on the host one. Uh, it's a back-to-back -back connection here. Um, on the left side, I have a P4 OBS running here uh, with uh, the same um, uh, internal bridge and uh, the TEP uh, the, the tunnel bridge. Um, and on the right side here in the picture, uh, I have um, the P4 target, which is programmed with uh, Sci.P4 and OBS.P4, so two P4 files. Uh, Sci.P4 uh, in this uh, program is doing NCAP and DCAP, and um, OBS.P4 is going to take care of uh, forwarding it for forwarding the packets to um, either P4 OBS or, uh, or the VMs here. Um, so, um, so, so basically when uh, VM2 uh, starts a ping to VM1 here, the ping will go through the uh, internal bridge into the tap, will get encapped here um, and, um, and go to the other side. So before the ping, um, ping goes out, um, uh, the side needs to know what the MAC address of the destination is. So it is gonna send the ARP request first. Uh, so let's go over, um, so, um, oh, okay, before that, um, these tap interfaces, right? So, uh, so we, we basically have um, all these ports, uh, internal, uh, the virtual and the physical port connected to the P4 target. And these tap interfaces um, are basically are used to um, send the packets from uh, P4 OBS into, uh, into the uh, VMs uh, into, into, from the P4 target. So for every port, we have a corresponding tap interface. So for port one here, we have a tap zero which is actually the TEP endpoint for um, uh, P4 OBS. Um, and we have TAP1 for VM1. So any packets coming from TAP1 are going to be sent to the P4 target and obvious.p4 will have a rule to forward it to VM1 and, uh, 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 and, um, uh, and on the other side as well. Uh, TAP2 is used to send the control packets out from P4 target uh, to P4 OBS. So the control packets that um, uh, the P4 target does not want to handle, it is going to send uh, it to the P4 OBS. So in this case, uh, the, in this case, ARP packet uh, will go to the P4 OBS uh, and fetch uh, the ARP response. Um, so P4 OBS uh, sends, uh, sees this ARP request and broadcasts the ARP request to the VM1 here. So the ARP uh, broadcast will go through tap one into the target to the VM1. Um, and uh, hence uh, the response will be found and uh, the ARP response is sent out again to the port, uh, through the port one. So we can go over um, this in the next slide. So this is the red uh, line is uh, how the ARP packet flows, which is the control path. And the green uh, line is how the data packet flows, which is ICMP here. So the ARP packet is initiated uh, from the OBS on the right, the stock OBS, and goes from a port one is encapped, uh, in, is encapped in the OBS on the right side, goes out through port one and um, uh, goes into the P4 target here, which is PSI.P4. PSI.P4 um, will take this, um, 
uh, package and it is going to decap the packet and the, R, the after the decap, the packet is going to send to going to be sent to the obs.v port uh, via the VXLAN zero port, which uh, which I said before that it, it is a kind of a packet buffer for the software or an internal port. Um, so uh, once the packet reaches um, obs.v port, it will it will have rules. Uh, to uh, that say that okay, this is an art packet. Uh, it needs to go to P4 P4 OBS. So it is going to go from here to the tap two into P4 OBS in the internal bridge. Hit the internal bridge. This is going to send the art request out to the VM one from tap one, and VM one receives the packet. So the response comes the same way and um, it goes out through tap two um, through through OBS dot P4. And in this, at the same time, um, the entry is added. The flow entry is added to the obs.p4, saying, "Okay, this is if this this is the MAC, this is the output port for the MAC for uh, VM1." And uh, this art response goes back into and gets encapped in the side.p4 and goes down uh, to the other side and um, gets decapped here and reaches uh, VM2. The pink packet comes from uh, VM, VM2 uh, again, gets encapped goes to port one on the left side, uh, gets in, and gets decapped on side of V4 uh, using the VXLAN table um, and goes up into OBS.v4 here. It will find the programmed entry, which was programmed uh, when the art packet came in. It will uh, see that VM1 is the final destination. So it's gonna send it out to the, uh, it's gonna find the rule that um, uh, VM1 is programmed uh, and it's gonna send the packet out to the VM1. So here ICMP is the data packet, uh, which goes directly to the destination uh, VM. And uh, the ARP was the control packet that um, uh, that had a flow from, uh, from OBS here. Um, these are the configurations, uh, OBS configurations on the host one and host two, the VXLAN configuration. So we have the bridge here uh, on host one and the port, um, internal port, the bridge port. Um, then we have tap one, tap two, and uh, VXLAN zero added as the VXLAN um, interface uh, to, to the uh, tap bridge. Uh, the tap bridge has uh, the tap endpoint, which is 70.0.1.1, .1, uh, .1, um, and, uh, and also has the tap zero port, which was corresponding to the physical port um, uh, on the host one. Um, on the right side, we have um, uh, the regular OBS configuration where uh, we have the VM2 attached to the internal bridge uh, and VXLAN zero port just like here. Um, and then we have the tap bridge, um, um, uh, which, which has the physical port as the uh, tap end point um, here. So as you see, uh, the configuration is uh, not different at all. Um, and uh, it, on the left side, it's just um, the, uh, the tap interfaces replace the, uh, the actual ports here. And the actual ports are actually handled by the people target. Um, here is an example, side.p4, VXLAN and cap, uh, and cap decap that shows uh, um, the NCAP and decap functions. So on the left side, there is a VXLAN NCAP. It will take all the outer header fields and all the entries that are needed to um, encapsulate the packet. And, um, and the action will basically um, assign all those values into the outer header and the VNI and, uh, and everything. Um, on the right side, uh, we have in the middle, we have uh, the action NCAP, which uh, basically calls this NCAP function and sends it out to port one. So basically this, this action is used for the packet that is coming in from, um, uh, from the obs.p4 to side.p4 and uh, wants to go out of the physical port. Um, and then we have uh, VXLAN decap action, um, which is basically taking in the packets from the physical port and decapping it and then sending it to the obs pipe here. So the, the, the decap action basically sets all the, the outer header invalid and just passes on the packet uh, to the upper uh, P4, uh, so overlay P4. Um, there are two tables defined, table VXLAN NCAP and table VXLAN DCAP, which, ma which match on uh, different fields uh, based on the direction and uh, call the NCAP and DCAP actions here in orange. Um, and uh, uh, the rightmost square is uh, the apply block which is called, uh, so if the, if the packet is coming from the tunnel, then you do a VXLAN decap on side.p4. So this is gonna call uh, this table uh, and um, match on this key and um, apply, sorry, the decap table match on this key and apply 
the GCAP action. And if the packet is coming from uh, the OBS.p4, it, uh, it is needs to be end capped and uh, sent it out via the physical port uh, from side of p4. So the action here is um, uh, basically end cap, end cap, uh, end cap, and then send to port one, which is the physical port. OBS.p4 here is pretty simple. Um, it says that if it is in, um, in the right side in the apply block, it says if it is an R packet, then uh, send it to tap2. So this tap2 was an interface that, uh, that is used to send the packet to the P4 OBS. Um, if uh, the packet is from a tap interface, then you do a tap table apply. A tap table apply is basically a mapping from the tap ports to the VMs. So if the packet is coming from the, uh, from, from the tap interface, you do uh, you look up the VM where the packet needs to be sent and then uh, send it out. And if uh, the packet is coming from either tap two or um, uh, or the import VXLAN zero, which was the uh, the buffer, the uh, uh, buffer or the internal port, uh, then you do an OBS table apply. So here, OBS table apply um, will basically send it out to um, uh, to to the VM. So part four takeaways, uh, here uh, we, uh, we saw that um, the OBS config um, does not change a lot from um, going from the stock OBS to P4 OBS. It only has different uh, NetApp port handles. And um, the kernel and OBS data plane uh, is migrated to the P4 target pipeline. Um, and here in the diagram, uh, we see the left to right function. Uh, so Psi.P4 here receives the packet. And then Psi.P4 is used to decap the packet and uh, uh, send it out on the uh, on the VXLAN zero tunnel port. Uh, then the, oh, the packet then matches the OBS.P4 and then is forwarded onto the virtual port. So uh, this uh, was an example for ARP and ICMP over VXLAN. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Gerald, who is going to talk about uh, ECMP and FRR. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Namrata, for the um, uh, introduction. So I'm Gerald Rogers with Intel. Uh, I'm here to uh, present to you uh, part five, which is uh, link redundancy with BGP, ECMP, and P4. Uh, what I want to show you today in, in this example is uh, utilizing uh, routing within the data center. Uh, so that we, if we look here, we have an example of a data center where we have a configuration where we have leaf routers uh, and spine routers that make up the core of the data center. And then we have a series of host in, hosts that are interconnected into the leaf uh, routers uh, that would then uh, provide uh, connectivity uh, to throughout the data center. Uh, the goal here is to uh, provide an example of how we use routing to get to the host uh, and then uh, from the host to the virtual machine or container uh, we would use layer 2 bridging uh, as an example using OBS. Uh, and uh, with this we would uh, utilize uh, unnumbered BGP uh, in order in the uh, BGP configuration in P4 at each particular node in the network. So uh, what we want to show is a demo that uh, we've created here uh, that uh, what we've done is taken the previous uh, slide uh, configuration and compressed it a little bit to make it a little bit more simple, uh, simple for uh, demonstration purposes. Uh, we have uh, in this demo two hosts. We have host one, uh, which uh, you can uh, imagine being inside of the data center and then host two uh, residing out on the internet somewhere. Uh, and then we have leaf one and leaf two, uh, which are providing redundant connectivity of, of host one to the internet itself. Uh, and uh, for each one of these, uh, we're using unnumbered BGP. So uh, the connectivity from uh, host one to each one of the leaf nodes, leaf routers, is uh, utilizing uh, IPv6 link local addressing. Uh, and then discovering the uh, BGP IPv4 routes over those links. So if we look at it, we what we've done here is we've uh, uh, assigned uh, host one a subnet of 10.3.01 and an aut autonomous uh, BGP system number of 65301. 
And correspondingly for host two, we have 10.4.0.1 and a uh, AS number of 65801. Now, both of the LEAF uh, routers uh, possess the same subnet, uh, which is 10.2.0.0, basically slash 24, but they have a different autonomous system numbers, 65201 and 65202. And so what we will see here is that uh, we can establish link redundancy and equal cost multipath routing between uh, each one, the two hosts uh, that BGP will propagate uh, the optimal path. Uh, any failure within uh, the connectivity, we will show uh, that traffic resumes and, and maintains connectivity. Uh, how we uh, are going to demonstrate this is we've set it up and emulated with four containers uh, uh, with uh, virtual ETH interfaces. And then we use FRR and BGP uh, uh, to provide the routing uh, uh, support. And then uh, Linux kernel routing and Linux bridges. And uh, then uh, each host will have a virtual IP address. So we go on to the next slide here. Uh, you'll see this is how it looks like in perspective from the a, a host. Uh, a LEAF uh, uh, router is very similar to this, uh, just a little bit different in terms of the virtual ETH interfaces. So you see that we have, uh, we're utilizing FRR uh, running on its own uh, instance uh, with uh, the Zebra and BGP daemons. Uh, both are uh, talking uh, Netlink uh, into the kernel uh, and they will util utilize Netlink to program the IP stack. Now for each host, we have three ethernet interfaces uh, that are VETH in this case, because we're running in a container. Uh, that uh, where uh, VE0 is connected to LEAF1, uh, VE1 is connected to LEAF2, and then we have a third inter uh, interface that we use for manageability purposes. And then uh, for uh, BGP, we'll assign a virtual IP on the loopback interface. So um, what we will show here is the uh, configuration and then um, how we uh, actually uh, do this. So let's quickly jump over to this. So looking back at to the slide that uh, the, the scenario that was in the presentation, uh, what we have here are uh, four uh, nodes that are active. Uh, down on the bottom, we have host one and host two. And then at the top, we have uh, leaf one and leaf two. So if we go to look at each one of these, we can do an IP route show. And you'll see that uh, on host one and host two, that uh, we have established uh, redundant ECMP paths uh, between uh, the, the, the leaf, router, leaf routers as well as to the uh, host two on leaf or on host one. You see this address here and we got two different paths to get there. Uh, and then subsequently on the host two, we have equivalent type of uh, redundant paths that are established between uh, 10.3 uh, allows us to get back to host one. And then if we do a similar type of thing on the, on the um, leaf nodes, you can see that we have uh, routes that are established uh, accordingly on these uh, particular uh, uh, leaves, uh, both allowing us to get connectivity to both of the hosts. Now we can do a uh, hop into uh, the zebra and we can do a, a show BGP IPv4 unicast. And you can see that we have the various respective subnets uh, that are, are connected here and the corresponding AS numbers or BGP a, uh, uh, AS numbers associated with it. So we get 10.3 is associated with uh, 65301 and 10.4 is associated with 65801. Uh, very similar type of um, uh, config, uh, sorry. Similar type of uh, configuration that exists on the um, uh, second leaf node. And we can go here. And then you see here on uh, uh, host one, uh, to, we have do redundant paths uh, to get to uh, the 10.2 subnet, uh, one on ETH1 and one on ETH2. And then we have a 10.3 uh, is local, and then 10.4 is also redundant across ETH2 and ETH1. And we will see something very similar on uh, 
And you see very similar type of connectivity on uh, host two. So, okay, so now we exit out of here, we can show the redundancy. And So we show that we get connectivity here. Okay. And then we'll do an IF config E2. Yeah. So you might see a little bit of a disruption in the traffic you saw here on this particular node, uh, but it will resume in just a minute or just a few seconds it should. There we go. So you can see that the traffic is resumed. Uh, the BGP timers are set accordingly. And then we can do I have config E2 down and you will see that uh, both nodes will actually stop and then you'll see network is unreachable at this point. So then we can go and do an I have config E2 up and we can establish reconnectivity uh, between both nodes. And that kind of demonstrates what is the demo that we're trying to establish to, with BGP routing to the host with uh, ECMP. Okay, so that's a quick demo uh, demonstrating the, the functionality that we plan to uh, enable. Go back over here. So what we did we, we demonstrated that uh, BGP unnumbered ECMP routing with re link redundancy. Uh, we, we demonstrated that uh, capability with the Linux kernel stack. And now what we want to do is to show how uh, P4 coupled with the Linux kernel stack uh, hooks via Netlink uh, will provide the uh, equivalent functionality. So we will we'll, we'll look at uh, Netlink P4 runtime and table API integration uh, to be released uh, that, that, that enables this capability. So if we look at uh, how this uh, we uh, will integrate this, uh, we, we maintain uh, the control plane uh, as would be in a standard Linux kernel environment. So we can use the standard shell commands, uh, IP route as an example, as I demonstrated. Uh, we'll have FRR uh, running uh, in its normal environment under Linux, uh, utilizing BGP and Zebra, uh, communi communicating over Netlink. Uh, and uh, so as, and then within the P4 OBS environment, or target, uh, we will have, uh, there's a Netlink listener and this Netlink listener is look, looking uh, and monitoring uh, routing updates, bridge updates, uh, IP and ARP uh, uh, configurations, uh, link updates. Uh, and as Namrana demonstrated and others that uh, we'll talk into the table API. Now, and the example here would be is that uh, we would be using uh, for our P4 program, Psy.P4. It would be an example of, of, of a, a P4 program that enables this capability. And uh, in essence, uh, running within the P4 target, uh, we would enable the Psy.P4 program that would communicate with the physical ports, or in this case, also virtual ports such as vhost. Uh, such that you could talk to a virtual machine, as an example, or a simplified container. Uh, as Namrana alluded, there are tap interfaces that tap into the Linux kernel, so that as packets uh, transit through the Psy.p4 program and they are destined for the kernel, uh, things such as ARP or BGP routing updates and such, uh, they would be forwarded over the tap interfaces and such that they could reach their appropriate destination, whether that be the IP stack in the kernel or whether that be up into uh, uh, Zebra slash BGP. So uh, that's how we intend to enable this capability uh, of integrating the kernel with P4. Uh, with P4. Okay. So let's take an example of ECMP action selector. Uh, so uh, the P4 program would be something very similar to this, uh, where we have a control, which is an IPv4 uh, forwarding information base. Uh, and uh, so a packet would hit here and then it would uh, have a, a two action uh, uh, capabilities, which is uh, based on the uh, next hop ID. Uh, so the action is a hit. Uh, so if we found it into the, in the forwarding table, we would uh, perform a ne the next hop ID is equal to the next hop that uh, we found. Uh, if we had a miss, then it would be considered a drop and we'd actually drop the packet. Uh, then it would, it would utilize an action selector, uh, which is uh, P, uh, the PSA hash algorithm, uh, CRC16. And then uh, a table would be an example of IPv4 wrap table, 
uh, where we utilize the key is uh, the meta.router, which is exact. Uh, IPv4 destination, destination address, we're utilizing the longest prefix, prefix match. Uh, and then also source port, destina destination port, uh, source address, and destina ad destination address uh, would be the appropriate selector. Uh, based upon the what we uh, the key that we hit, we would have either actions hit or miss, and of course the default action is miss, and then uh, PSA implementation equals AS. Now uh, the apply would be uh, if we have an IPv4 uh, IPv4 is valid, then we do an IPv4 route apply. So this is a sample of the P4 program uh, that would be utilized to enable uh, the ECMP uh, capability. So to kind of summarize here, uh, ECMP with OBS, uh, we have a table API that supports multiple pipelines, uh, each with separate control planes. Uh, and uh, interconnection of data planes is accomplished via logical internal ports. So this would demonstrate uh, similar to what Namrata uh, provided, which is we have uh, two separate data planes, uh, P4 programs in instance. Uh, one is an OBS uh, P4 pipeline, uh, as well as the kernel uh, side up P4 program. And uh, by utilizing interconnectivity uh, between the two different uh, P4 uh, runtimes, uh, sorry, P4 target run instances, we can demonstrate that uh, virtual ports are that are unencapped packets would be transmitted out uh, first into the uh, OBS. Uh, instance, which would then uh, perform a layer two operation and forward to a tunnel port. Uh, the tunnel port resides within the Psi.p4 program. Uh, and then, so a Psi.p4 program would receive the packet and then uh, encapsulate the packet and then use the appropriate routing tables that we learned from the kernel and, and uh, uh, BGP and, and FRR, uh, and then perform, a, a, utilizing the action selector, we uh, pick the next hop Mac and the physical port that the packet would be sent out. And so the packet would be sent out onto the physical port. So this just shows how we uh, not, can support multiple data planes uh, within the same uh, uh, P4 target uh, instance. Okay, so now I'll turn it over to a new, new part of Jane, uh, who will start cover part six, which is Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, service intro. Hi, um, I'm Lupur, and I'm going to start over part six of our overall presentation, which is using Kubernetes CNI controller to control the P4 pipeline, which is uh, running the entryr.p4 program. So before I go deeper into that thing, I would just do a small introduction on what is Kubernetes uh, service. The Kubernetes service is deployed using a YAML file, and uh, in my case, my service is called Frontend Service, and it's listening on port 80. It's deployed as a replica of three uh, containers. And then every time you deploy the service, create a service object, it assigns this service a front end, a VIP address, and a DS, DNS name. The users would usually use this virtual IP address to connect to one of the endpoints um, at any time. And this whole magic is done by QProxy sitting um, here, which is a daemon. So every request that comes to virtual IP actually um, intercepted by this uh, QProxy daemon. And it does, under, uh, under the uh, background, it, under the covers, it does a load balancing to one of the endpoints and also does a DNAT to send the traffic out. So today, this is all done by kernel uh, IP table rules, which QProxy controls. We are trying to offload the entire logic into P4. Uh, using entry.info. So here's um, node flows. Uh, this is how uh, the traffic flows from one node in the cluster to another node in the cluster. So as I earlier mentioned, you know, we have services which are known by port, protocol, and namespace. And each service has multiple endpoints, and it's front, uh, front ended with a VIP address. Uh, as in my case, this is. 192.178.5.6, and there are a couple of endpoints which serve the same service traffic. And then what else is needed is, is uh, connection tracking because you want to pin the flow once the endpoint has been decided uh, rest of the session. 
And then natting, which is uh, SNAT and the NAT, uh, needs to be done for the traffic. So let's take an example here uh, to go through the traffic from one node to another node. So I have service A deployed on node A and node B, two replicas. And then the client is 10.1.1.2, which is trying to reach the service. So the 10.1.1.2 will initiate request, which will be intercepted by the queue proxy, converted, uh, load balanced, converted into one of the endpoint. The endpoint sits on the same node, and it's converted from 1.1.1.2 to 1.1.1.3. It's in the same subnet, so the traffic will go to 1.1.1.3 uh, and come back without any problems. Um, Supposing this is translated to an endpoint that is sitting on some different node, um, so the traffic will initiate from uh, the client. It will be intercepted by the queue proxy. Queue proxy will uh, uh, load balance it to other node service A. Since that subnet doesn't reside on this local host, the routing table will be looked up, and then for that uh, subnet on the other node, there will be a route. Um, next half, uh, which will be decided. So traffic will be sent to this tunnel interface. Um, two nodes are actually connected to a tunnel interface, and this is uh, set, set up uh, prior to entrea.v4 using an infrastructure uh, v4 through sci.v4. The tunnel pre exists and the ports exist. So traffic will, in this case, use the tunnel interface as a next hop. And it will go to the other side, it will be decrypted and sent to the service. The traffic again from the service will start with a destination IP of 10.1.1.2 and the source IP address of 10.2.1.3. Since the subnet doesn't exist here, again, the routing table will be looked up and next stop will be the tunnel. It will go through the tunnel, get calculated. Now, here the connection tracker comes into play because the so when was it, it was leaving, it was added to a CD table with the uh, action marked as, uh, as a DNAT. So it knows now when it comes back, that it needs to be SNATed back. It will be SNATed back and sent to the same point um, at, the, at, at the client uh, on node A. Now there's another aspect to it because uh, if a service sits not in the cluster and it sits somewhere else, uh, supposing there's a global DNS server, then the service has to be uh, sent out of this node, uh, again, through routing interface to uh, external uh, entity. In that case, it will be SNATed because you want the reverse traffic to come back to the same host and it will be sent out. So all these uh, flows are actually mapped either into L2, L3, CT, uh, NAT, uh, pretty much on uh, on the cluster. Then there is something called policies because um, in Kubernetes you want to say uh, when you deploy a service that service is listening only on ET. So any client that wants to connect to the service can only be allowed to connect to port ET. And there are policy rules that match up on a group of ports or a, a group of IP addresses to say these policies are applied on polling ports. And then there could be uh, some spoof checks, like uh, the traffic that's originating on node A can only have the node A uh, IP addresses, which are allowed on node A and not anything else. So all these policies together with routing, forwarding, and tunneling take care of uh, networking in a data center. So here is a bit of explanation on how would you do this. So for the load balancing part, I just want to go through this table to explain how it can be done using V4. Uh, so currently in the IP tables proxy mode, the AP, API server is the one that discovers what forms part of my cluster, uh, what is my service, and what is my namespace, and uh, converts that into a range of IP addresses that apply to my service ports. And then Q Proxy goes and configures the IP tables for uh, pre-routing, post-routing, NAT, masquerading rules. 
so that eventually the load balancing happens to one of the endpoints. Uh, in my case, my service was front end. So one, one of the endpoints, uh, targeted endpoint. Same thing can be done in P4 using something which is a PSA term called action select. Action select makes it much simpler in implementation where API server will still control, detect what, uh, what is the part of my content service, what IPs and things belong to my part of uh, service, and it will program what is called action selector. So usually what happens is it's a table uh, where you have uh, a key which becomes the virtual IP address of the service and the uh, accessible port. Um, so first layer of classification happens, which picks up this uh, exact key, which is the cluster IP and the port. And based on that, it goes and selects a group member, which is G1 in my case. Now each G1 has been configured with a couple of members. Uh, so since I had three replicas, I have M1, N2, and M3 here. And each of them is an action profile that gets programmed with uh, the action. So in my case, um, the second layer of classification is going to be a pipe table. So it's going to be on um, the incoming traffic pipe table, which is going to be hashed to give me one of the members of this group G1. Supposing um, the hash comes to say M1, the action spec would say, hey, change my destination IP address to my endpoint IP address. And then the traffic is mapped. So destination IP now becomes 10.1.1 from cluster IP of 10.111.66.168. And it eventually ends up on my backend port, port number three. Um, so all the DNAT and the load balancing has been taken care of by one action selector. So here's a pipeline for Cube Proxy. Um, this is a P4 based pipeline. So initially what happens is the traffic can come uh, from underlay P4 program on three different ports. You have a tunnel port which from where the uh, traffic comes from the other node in the cluster. We have a gateway where external traffic would end in, um, uh, to, the, to the node. And then you have local traffic which comes from the, from the port which is sitting on the same node. The first is pretty much the classification where you uh, map which port traffic is coming on. And then there is a system level ACRs where you say, uh, you know, this traffic on this IP addresses are not allowed. I want to drop them. These are pretty much the security policies that are at a global level. And then there's an ARP responder because if it's an ARP packet, it has to be responded back and then uh, the response back. Uh, followed by Q proxy, which I just showed uh, before action selector, which does the selection of NP as well as the DNAT rule. And then it sets a metadata to say, hey, this is the cluster IP and it has been DNATed. So on the reverse path, we have to make sure we take care of reverse traffic. Uh, followed by um, uh, followed by egress policy. Uh, here, the egress actually uh, means that the traffic is going out uh, of, of the pod, and ingress means the traffic is going towards the pod. So now the traffic is supposing coming from the local pod, uh, it's been load balanced. Now it's going to be applied an egress policy in terms of like what port is allowed to uh, be sending this traffic out of the, uh, of, uh, the pod followed by a L3 forwarding rule, which actually checks whether the targeted port sits on the same node or it's sitting on a different node. And then um, based on routing, it figure out uh, where to send it. Supposing based on routing, we figure out the next stop is the tunnel. In that case, there's a decrement, uh, you have to decrement the detail count and then send it to uh, the ingress policy. In our case, because um, it it originated from local port. We would not be sending it to the tunnel. So uh, just after DNAT, it will go back to the ingress policy for that port. 
which will define that there is uh, the destination port happens to be the port which is allowed for the service and then the, uh, the thing will be uh, the flow would be added to contract um, the contract um, for pna runner works uh, what we are trying to find the specs for pna is to do an auto add increase for the contract so the both uh, reverse flow as as well as the uh, actual flow are both added and there's a hit counter on both entries. But in this case, because we have only seen one direction traffic, there's a hit counter only in that direction. Uh, followed by an L2 forwarding, which will define which port it goes out and what is the source MAC. So eventually the traffic will either go out of uh, the V port, which belongs to the pod, or it will go out of a tunnel in the place, or it will go out uh, through the gateway. So here's a small load balancer action selector um, implementation, which is an external in PSA, a pretty powerful one. So here, what we have done is we have an ingress load balancer, which uh, has a destination IP with both. Um, so the key first level classification, as I mentioned, is based on the which this ends up at, and the L4 requested port and the destination IP, which happens to be the cluster IP. So first level classification will give me a group, uh, and group will have multiple members, which will have uh, endpoint IP addresses. So followed by a second level classification, once we reach the group to each member, which happens to be a selector on source address, destination address, uh, uh, and the uh, and the and the IP address, uh, MAC address, and the IP address uh, level. It will give me a hash to pick a member out of that selector group, and that that member will eventually have the NAT action on hit. Um, so on hit, what we do is change the destination IP address with the endpoint IP address and the port to match the service. So this uh, explains how E4 can do the DNAT and the Q proxy action, pretty much the Q proxy action to action selector. So here, um, what I have done is run the same program, uh, compiled it uh, using um, uh, uh, using uh, my compiler, PSA compiler, and then um, I've loaded this particular uh, context compile back in artifact into a model and then use the P4 input generated to drive a map table programming using P4 runtime interface um, uh, the table APIs into my model. So uh, the interface map all my action selector tables into my table APIs. And this is a capture of real-time run system where um, uh, there's an ingress parser followed by uh, the, uh, the header um, parsing for uh, the Ethernet and the um, IP uh, headers. And if you look into this, there's a switching pipeline, which is forward hit, which is my action selector, which uh, actually is uh, for the very first fact was hit. And action selector uh, map my traffic to actually a destination, uh, do the set destination to map it to an endpoint. Super, thank you uh, for that section. Uh, so just to uh, summarize, um, uh, taking all these pieces together, uh, in, in the picture here, you know, we're showing how uh, uh, the, the Kubernetes program is, is, is sitting at the top and through the, the CNI is being programmed into P4 OBS. And this enables uh, OBS when it receives a packet to run the P4 program that's needed to do the Kubernetes load balancing and also to apply the different security ACLs uh, using the connection tracker. And then once that packet is processed and determines that it needs to go out a logical port, it'll send it to that port, which on the other side, inside the side.p4, the, the program that's emulating the kernel, uh, it will take that packet, encapsulate it, and also look up the routing information from FRR and then decide what MAC address it should go out on and what physical port it should be sent on. 
So it, it, in this uh, example, we've now taken all three of these different components, put them together, uh, and now have uh, uh, for each packet potentially applying the data plane from all three of these control planes on, on, on the same packet simultaneously. And that sort of uh, uh, brings us to how we wrap up in terms of what we've developed. So uh, we've shown today how we can have multiple control planes running at the same time. Uh, they can have their own life cycle, the startup independence, they can reset independent of one another. They may not even know about each other, uh, but using the same constructs that OBS today uses where it is leveraging pieces of the kernel, leveraging its own vSwitch capability, and then also exposing an interface to an SDN controller. We're doing these same concepts, but at the very bottom, what we've done is we've enabled a P4 pipeline uh, to optimize the data plane and have it run faster. And so uh, underneath these multiple control planes, we have these multiple data planes where uh, a single P4 program isn't sufficient to be able to give that control plane isolation. And so in this example, we've instantiated two separate programs uh, based on the, the ingress port that they come in on so that we can have uh, uh, these different control planes be able to apply their logic uh, and then pass the, the packet through an internal port to then be processed by the, uh, by the other program. And, and at the bottom, we also showed how uh, you can be multi-target where uh, inside P4OVS, you can bind uh, when you start the application to the target that, that, that is running. Uh, you need to compile your P4 programs and load that into the target. Uh, but once that's done, you can then program those targets to the table API. Uh, and the table API can connect to the P4 runtime and open config module that, uh, that Brian talked about earlier. And so uh, with all these pieces together, uh, this allows you to take a standard server and use P4 to preserve all of the things that you had always done on that standard server and make sure that uh, the, 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 the routing and the Kubernetes and the, the things that you need on that server will continue to work and have the same control plane that you did before. In addition, you can use the P4 to add to that, to be able to customize, to be able to enhance that in an SDN fashion. And we use Kubernetes today as, as that um, type of example. Uh, and so uh, this uh, 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 project will um, be open sourced and coming uh, later this year uh, as these components uh, you know, start to uh, fit together uh, and uh, be ready for, for others to, to give it a try. Thank you for the time. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the, our tutorial today. Thank you.